great. It's wonderful to be here with all of you. And Web Summit is one of my favorite events. So it's a double pleasure. And working in this space with so many people that share a common vision for a decentralized future is an awesome experience. And I think we can move there rather rapidly if we take advantage of what I believe, and the reason I came back is because I think we have now a main chance to take the energy of blockchain forward into a consumer product at a global scale that will cement the future of position of blockchain and provide a platform on which dApps can flourish. There are really four key requirements in order to meet this dream. And the first is, of course, that consumers don't want to wait a long time for payments or messages to complete. So we'd like to make something that is like WeChat, but with blockchain inside, and it's gonna to have to do transactions rather quickly. The next thing is that most people, of course, don't want all of their payments history transparently, immutably on the blockchain. So we need at least some level of privacy for payments to have widespread consumer adoption, and we probably need a, actually a better type of privacy than current messaging systems, even the privacy-oriented ones, provide, because consumers are now becoming aware of the importance of the, what Edward Snowden called the full take, and the, the, the graph, the social graph, and all the information that's revealed by who you talk to and when. And so we'll probably want to address those issues yes. as well. And if we can do this, then that will, of course, mean that we have to be able to provide these sorts of transactions at consumer scale, like 100,000 transactions a second in the coming months, and then amp up to three quarters of a million per second uh, in the coming year or so. Now, there's a fourth requirement that is not often discussed, but that is that many countries don't really relish the idea of other countries coming in and controlling their own consumer payment systems and messaging systems. And if you look around the world, there's a fair amount of this. And Countries need to be able to protect themselves and to create, actually, what's needed is a level playing field for sophisticated financial services to bring the billion-plus people who have smartphones and no bank accounts, for example, in, into a world where they can take advantage of all the sophisticated products that are available to some of us. So what we've been able to do is actually meet these requirements completely. And you might ask, well, how is that possible? Everyone in the, in the community has been working towards this for years, but they haven't been able to get there. And actually, there's a fundamental good reason why we can do this. And that is because of two fundamental breakthroughs in cryptography that one of which at least took me quite a lot of effort. And it is reflected in the fact that unlike other blockchains with Elixir, there are, let's say, eight nodes that contribute to each block. And the set of nodes is chosen randomly and uh, uniformly and independently and unmanipulatable 
ultimately uh, by a distributed random algorithm and that creates a schedule of these eight nodes, different set of eight nodes per second. And we're able to leverage this difference to uniquely be able to provide privacy. And I will show you the underlying mechanism for that now here in a kind of cartoon uh, manner analogy. So suppose that Alice wants to send a message to Bob, but she doesn't want anyone to know that she's in communication with Bob. And when she talks to Bob, that's the traffic analysis data, the social graph, right? So the content of Alice's message to Bob could be protected by so-called strong encryption, but that doesn't protect th this metadata, which is far more revealing and about which you really cannot lie. So we've shown here three robots. These stand for three of the uh, what would usually be around eight nodes that are, that are scheduled to uh, work together during one second, but far in the future. So they do a lot of work here, bending these tubes. Each robot chooses a different pattern of, of tube, so that comes in one place and comes out at a random other place. That random rearrangement or shuffle or permutation, if you will, is chosen independently, randomly, uniformly, as like a secret key of that node. And it, they do a lot of effort to build that box so that later, when they're, they're up to bat, so to speak, when their team is, is selected, all the users can insert messages, one message per tube, and the nodes can just blast those through like a hyper hyperloop. Um, and when they come out, no one knows who put that message in. But they, it says on it, deliver to Bob, so they can deliver it to Bob. And then they know they delivered it to Bob, so they can actually then put a little message back into that same tube and send the little blue check mark back to Alice. So even though they don't know who Alice is, she now knows that Bob got her message. And then the robots destroy these boxes and they're never used again. So they're only used for this one sending of messages. And the idea is this, this effort to build the boxes is done well in advance and in the real time moment when that batch is sent through, it's extremely efficient. There's no public key operations involved. So that's one of the breakthroughs that provides a solution to the traffic analysis problem. We could also use this for payments. You'll notice some of these messages input could also be just sort of addressed to the nodes and say, okay, here's some payment instructions. So let's see what, what those could look like because we had to improve on the way blockchain does payments uh, today. It's based, as you, many of you I assume know, on a single public key digital signature per transaction where the signer is the owner of a, a wallet and they say, I want to move money from my wallet ID to some other wallet ID. This involves public key encryption per transaction, which is very hard to achieve on a per uh, uh, transaction basis at scale uh, because of the, uh, the cumbersomeness uh, when you want to do quantum resistance. Plus, it doesn't really lend itself to privacy. So what we do in Elixir, we've chosen a, a, a unique approach, which is draws from what was implemented in the 90s with eCash. You know that eCash was issued by Deutsche Bank, by in US dollars and uh, uh, Australian dollars and all kinds of things, plus an airdrop that I did called Cyberbox. You can read about it on my website, charm.com. Now there's a little museum about DigiCash history, uh, but uh, the approach that we took in those days was a 
what I called a digital bearer instrument, a number that itself was worth money. And the uh, way it worked was with like, like coins and banknotes, you'd have different denominations. And since we are computer people, we chose one cent, two cent, four, eight, 16, 32, 64. And if you had a, a complete set of 14 coins, one for each uh, denomination, then you could make a payment for any amount in exact cents up to about $150 and with an average of only seven coins. So this is the approach we use here. And let me show you how that can work with these uh, robots and all. So I'll just uh, say here that Bob wants to receive a dollar in this example from Alice. So he sends Alice an invoice requesting this dollar. Now he creates the invoice by choosing a random number, independently, uniformly, at random, like a secret key, and then he hashes that number using a hash function, a public hash function that I'm, I'm sure most of you are uh, familiar with. So then what he provides to Alice is that hash. And the little padlock there is just to symbolize, if you can see it, that he knows the secret key to unlock that hash, so to speak. So if Alice wants to then pay Bob the dollar, she sends a message to the nodes, kind of like what we saw, let me just back up here, what we saw before here, uh, she addresses it instead of Bob to the nodes. And the nice thing is that no one knows whether these messages are like text messages or payments, they're all indistinguishable at this input port. So that's uh, nice from a privacy point of view. So, so the nodes get this message from Alice. It has two parts. There's two numbers in the message. One is the hash that she got from Bob, okay? And the other one is the secret that Alice created previously when, let's say, Joe paid her the dollar in the first place. So that was the secret sh that she hashed to get money from Joe, which we're not showing here. But so, so she reveals the, the secret and her hash is on the Merkle tree and it's marked as being worth $1. So the, the robots, the nodes can check this and remove it uh, from the, uh, the tree and put Bob's hash, which is the second component of the message, on the Merkle tree, and now Bob can see that his hash is on the tree, and so he knows that only he can spend that money because only he has the secret key that he used to create that hash. So everyone's happy. There's what we call in payments, finality, irrevocability of the payment. But another interesting thing to notice is that actually this so-called Merkle signature, the path up to the root of the Merkle tree, is very, a very compact signature that could be sent by the nodes back through the path to Alice like they sent the blue check mark before. So now Alice would efficiently receive irrefutable proof of finality, and then she could even send that to Bob. So neither Alice nor Bob actually have to look at the tree. They can just sit there and uh, use their smartphones. So we've built this. We've been running it for several months uh, in several cloud servers. We have automatic deployment with Terraform and Docker and all like that. And you can uh, see our block explorer that we built on our website. It's running live and we've been using it to send messages. Uh, it, like among the developers extensively. Uh, uh, you can see the server logs uh, here and uh, we've also built the payments part that's running as well. We've tested it pretty extensively. Uh, we don't really use it ourselves, but it is working. And the, you can see the, if you 
it's kind of dim here, but I hope you can see these are the actual uh, cursor, addressable, monitor type of UIs that we work with in order to give us flexibility to, to experiment with all kinds of uh, designs, but and UI and UX, but the most interesting thing is that we have it running on smartphones, Android and iOS APIs, and those are actually the same APIs as on Linux, Windows, and, and Apple iOS that I showed earlier. And when you run this on a smartphone, it doesn't use any more data plan than WeChat. It doesn't use any more uh, battery power because there's very little public key operations than WeChat. And it doesn't make you wait longer than WeChat. So it's like what consumers want, but with blockchain inside. You get all, you, you amp up the, the privacy in messaging beyond anything that's available today. You give adequate privacy in payments, and you get the, the blockchain uh, rec records and you know, uh, integrity that's provided if you want to show that you did something at a certain time. And um, this will then provide an ideal platform for dApps. You know, if you can go to a, a merchant and say, here, accept these payments, you don't have to give two and a half or five percent to a bank, just accept these payments, are they going to say no? Are, we've seen consumers migrate from less secure messaging systems to ones that provide end-to-end -end encryption. Will we see them migrate to ones that provide both metadata protection and this immutability and, and, and recordation? I hope so. Well, so then, once we have mass adoption of this, the real question is, okay, can we unleash the magic of dApps? Just like Android and iOS or Facebook, you know, they, everyone has found that Microsoft before them, you want to let developers create stuff. Now, we don't have to take an egregious share of what, what the DAP developers uh, can uh, be rewarded with, but we, we do have a way to allow a DAP to run off-chain so we don't have the performance issues like some other well-known chains have with running uh, smart contracts and so on. We run them completely off-chain but we have an extremely secure multi-sig interface which allows them to run on-chain as if they were, uh, to appear to run on-chain as if they were really completely on-chain. They get all the benefits of running on-chain without actually uh, slowing the main ch chain down at all. And this provides an ideal platform for, for, for dApps so long as you can actually distribute the computation of a DAP, then you can, um, whatever platform is uh, most suitable for it, then you can interface to our chain securely through multi-sig. So I want to uh, just uh, thank you all for your uh, interest and uh, ask you, I hope that you um, will join our community and work with us to take blockchain mainstream.